Hey everybody, T-Bear here, cats and kittens. We're with you today on The Bear Facts. And I have a very special guest, a very good friend of mine, Mark Foster over here. And uh, you're in uh, Atlanta, are you? I'm in Atlanta right now, yeah. You're in Atlanta, okay. I'm in LA here in Atlanta. We've uh, we've done these Zoom things with The Bear Facts all around the world. Uh, we we uh, talked, uh, recently with Will Lee, the bass player, and he was in France, you know, sitting out the COVID. And uh, we talked with uh, Walter Trout, a great blues guitar player, and he was in Denmark. And uh, we're gonna get to you in the Peach State now, in Atlanta. And um, I lived there once, it was a pretty cool place. I lived there in ancient dinosaur times when Jimmy Carter was the governor. Um, I was living with a guy called Al Cooper, and Al Cooper had started a record company called Sounds of the South Records. And uh, he went and found his first band was a band that got some popularity called Leonard Skinnerd. And uh, he signed them and, and the rest is history. And Al, Al was br brilliant keyboard player. I mean, he played, uh, he played keyboards on, uh, he played B3 on uh, um, Dylan's uh, Like a Rolling Stone and uh, played with the Stones, um, Can't Always Get What You Want, played keyboards on that, you know, and he had, and he started the Blood, Sweat, and Tears, so he was a pretty smart cookie. And he, Did we, you come down here to make a record with him? Um, I came down here to learn from him. I wanted him to mentor me, you know, I was kind of in the mentoring stage, and, um, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. It was a pretty cool, uh, uh, tutoring thing. Al was, uh, Al played it close to the vest, but he liked me and, and I liked the people that he had around him. And, and I wanted to learn a lot, you know, I was a young kid at the time and, and, and thankfully I, I learned a lot and I loved Atlanta, by the way, I thought Atlanta was, was really cool. I've lost you somehow. Let's see if we can get you. Wait, back. am I here? No, can we're, you hear me? Now I can hear you. Okay. And okay, okay. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, it was a pretty cool, pretty cool town. So let's get to you because you are the you are the focal point of the of the of the convo today. And um, so um, you were born in um, Ohio. I was born in the Bay Area, Bay. actually, in San o San Jose. Yeah, and then and then we moved to Cleveland when I was five. Okay, what was it yeah. like being in Cleveland as a kid? Well, uh, I remember, I remember going to the airport. I didn't want to leave California. All my friends were there and I cried my way to the airport. <laughs> I cried myself to sleep on the plane. And then I woke up in a house. I, I remember just like, it was like cried myself into like, it was just like a blackout basically and woke up the next morning <laughs> and walked outside and saw a farm for the first time. Wow. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the way the trees looked, the way a farm looked, just, it was just like a different world. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, so it was like a bit of a culture shock, but um, I'm like, looking back, I'm really glad I grew up there because, you know, I, I got to have like a real childhood. I mean, like I, you know, uh, explore, I spent so much time in the woods you know, uh, just in my running around, playing capture the flag with friends, getting in camouflage and like pretending we were in some kind of like war situation, running around the forest, you know, Rambo style. Like that's just, you know, I, I don't know. My imagination, I think definitely like benefited from having really nothing else to do. Sure. There was really not, not much to do. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Looking back, it was cool. But funny enough, like I remember being in like first grade, second grade, telling you know, like I want to go back to California. Like you know, when are we gonna go back to California? And my parents were like, Well, you know, when you're 18, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and I'm like, Well, when I'm 18, I'm moving back to California. And by the time I was 17, uh. I was totally happy in Ohio and didn't really cross my mind, but sure enough, you know, I had this conversation with my dad 
one morning, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And he was like, you know, you've always loved music. Why don't you, don't you go to LA or New York and give it a shot? Wow. And, and it was kind of like a light bulb moment. And, All right, let me ask you a so, question about, yeah. about music. Um, yeah. What's the first record or piece of music you, you purchased? Can you remember that? Well, yeah, I do. I, the first record that was purchased for me because I wanted it, but I was too little because I didn't have my own money right. was the Beach Boys. It was a single. It was I Get Around. It was a cassette tape. Um, and it was I Get Around. And then on the other side was Fun, Fun, Fun. And that, that was kind of like a love affair for me. Like yeah. that opened up a whole world for me. It, and it, then, uh, but the first thing I bought with my own money yeah. when I was 10 and right. it was Ace of Base. <laughs> wow. And the first CD I bought with my own money was Daft Punk Homework, their first CD. I remember buying Daft Punk, the CD of Daft, the single. Right. I bought, and then also I think the same Audi and I bought the single for Coolio's Gangster Paradise. No, oh, I remember. I love that. I love that record. <laughs> I love that. And then I got, and then I got the Weird Al Yankovic Amish Paradise oh, as shit. well. And I listened <laughs> to both of those on repeat. That's hysterical, man. That's hysterical. Yeah. Well, I I know you love the Beach Boys, and I was going to actually bring this up, and it's funny that you that you that you mentioned the Beach Boys because, to me. You are so much like Brian Wilson in your talent. It's incredible. The way, the way that you phrase things, the way that you, you, your chord structure, the way you go on certain things. And to me, that's, that's like a little bit of, of heaven on earth. I mean, because I, I just love that man. And I, I heard that, interestingly enough, uh, on It's Okay to Be Human. Mm. I, I did a little bit of, you know, I did a little bit of homework on you. Um, we were, we're buddies and all, but um, I heard a little something on that when I was watching that Colbert piece that you, that you did. And, and I recommend yeah. everybody to go and go on YouTube and, and witness It's Okay to Be Human by Mark Foster on Stephen Colbert. It's a great video. It's a great piece of music. It's a great moment in COVID style um and and i i heard a little bit of beach boys influence on that i mean you're you know the the, the bells the the vibes you know the chord yeah. structure and, and, the, and the and the vocals the many vocals you put on that thing mm. yeah that was really yeah funny. it's 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 funny you know i it's it's weird it's just one of those things it was such a part of my early life that i think I think it informs everything I'll ever do musically because it's just, it's, I don't know. It's, there's a joy. There's something about Brian Wilson. I mean, he's my favorite songwriter uh, of all time. I just, I listen to that, you know, he's just got such a wide, it's just, it's so deep. He's and a he's a, he's a genius. And true genius. That word you know, is anti around true, too he's much. A true genius. Yeah. No, he's a true genius. But he's a true genius. He really he's is. An, he's an American. It's so weird. It's treasure. so weird. He really is. And it's so weird. Like, I, like his songs are so, like, I'm just like, how did you go from that to that? How did you find that harmony in that? How did you get that counter harmony? Like, why did you use a, like a bass clarinet to do that? But I love it. Oh, right. my God. Right. It's so good. Right. You know, and it's just kind of, yeah, it's just I, I've, I've been exploring. I'll, I'll explore that music my entire life, you know, and there's always something new that I find when I listen you know, that's, to it. But, that's why the BBC, when they wanted to honor music of all the songs that they picked, God Only Knows was the one that they picked. Mm, I didn't I, know that. I didn't know they picked that. Wow. Yeah. And not only did they pick that, I recommend you watch that BBC God Only Knows video because all their artists sing that song, you know, one line at a time. And, it, and, and at one point they have Brian there and he's singing it with them. And, um, you know, the changes in that, I mean, God Only Knows, right? It's astounding. 
it is astounding. That that's my favorite song of all time, and it has been for a long time. And it's just it makes me tear up every single time I hear it. And when you listen to it, it's really not that long. It's 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 a short song, but it's such a full meal. And that's the thing is like that's something that as I've you know gotten older and and keep kind of trying to go deeper in songwriting, I've really been trying to write shorter songs that still feel like a full meal. It's like it's like it's the changes well, in that it ha- it's just there's so many changes, but it's it doesn't feel taxing. Right. It doesn't feel overwhelming. You know, people, you're, you're you're led by the hand through the entire thing. People don't realize it's well, they you know, songwriters realize this, but a lot of people don't realize that we only have three or four minutes to tell the story. And yeah. we we have to tell you the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story. You know, and if and if we can't do it in three minutes, it ain't gonna get done. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah yeah and i think that's why we all also want to write stories that are long because we've been cut and edited so short that now we want we want to write a book we want to write a screenplay we want to write a treatment for a, a tv series we want to do something like that as as songwriters because we we're always edited we're cut so short that's true yeah that that's what very i very true so um now we're we're seventeen. We're in. Um, you don't mind if we go a few more minutes, do you? No, no, no. I'm having a cool time. Um, yeah. You're you're uh, you're seventeen. You're in you're in Cleveland, right? Yeah. And um, and your dad is 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 cool with you. You know, taking up music and everything. Um, did you go out lo- hear live bands? Did you get in- influenced by wanting to play live at that point? Putting a band together. Yeah. Yeah, I put a band together. I had a band in Cleveland. So I put I started I started usually for guys like us, it was garage band. I had a garage band that I started with a friend when I was 13. Right. And that was like when I first started writing songs and imitating, you know, I was imitating all the stuff that I was listening to. And at that time it was all the grunge stuff from Seattle. So it was Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and Nirvana and you know, um you had some pretty uh, good influences there. Yeah, that was like, that was kind of that era. Smashing Pumpkins, um, you know, uh, and then and then it, and then that was kind of the gateway into harder stuff. And so they went to like Rage Against the Machine, Deftones, Tool. And then that went into hardcore music because at the time Cleveland was such a metal town. It was all metal and hardcore that sure, like going to shows downtown, all the local shows, that's what we would go to. And so that start, that became like, I, I was super in that scene. So I was in a hardcore band. Did you ever go to the Ridgefield uh, Coliseum? Yes. When I was really young, because it's not there anymore, I don't think. No, it's not. Uh, I, opened, I think, I, opened I, think I went with, I saw Kenny G there play with my mom <laughs> when I was a kid. I opened for um, the Jay Giles band then. Oh, amazing! Yeah, yeah, I love Cleveland. Do you ever, you ever play at Blossom? No, I played at um, the Agora, I think. Yeah, the yeah. Agora. And I stayed at Swingos. I don't know Swingos. Swingos was was like the the rock hotel at the time. That was the spot, like yeah. in the flats or something. Yeah, that was the, that was the cool that was, spot. That was the spot. Yeah, the Agora. I saw Kid, so Kid many Leo shows was, at the Agora. Kid Leo was God. He, Kid Leo was the DJ that you had to, you know, like, we're not worthy. That's the guy. Play our single, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, you know, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a good, it was definitely a good incubating period being there, you know. The stakes okay. weren't too high. It was all just for the love of music. It's a cold place, so you know you're indoors a lot practicing. There's nothing else to do. Yeah, you're on the you're on the lake. It's yeah, yeah, and the rivers and all that. Yeah. So I'm going to tell everybody that you have this most amazing band called Foster the People, and and uh, we got to talk a little bit about that because that that launched you into the stratosphere um, from that moment on. Um, 
how did you how did you know that this was this was the the you know this was this was the thing this was you know what you wanted to attach your you know your life to with these guys how do you find how do you find i've always wondered you know cuz musicians find musicians you, you know and it's all and you go through a million a million guys playing and everything and everybody fits for a minute and they don't fit for a minute and this and that how do you find or how do you feel about when you know it's right i want to hear this from you because you're you're a brilliant cat that's a great it's a great question uh it's a really important question too i mean i think yeah for me uh with it with this band i've been through so many failed bands then i learned from each failed band i learned something you know i learned something along the way um and at, and what the biggest thing that I learned going into this band, and it was kind of a rule that I had for myself, was that the personalities needed to fit first. Mm -hmm. That the talent obviously is important, but the personality, how people gelled together, how the people, how the people were. Right. Um, I, I really, I, I, that was something that was really important to me in this time. Cause I'd been in other bands before where they were just like really, you know, badass session guys and, you know, but their, but their personalities didn't gel. They did, their hearts weren't in it. They could show up and be, they could be incredible in the room, but the spirit wasn't a band. It was just, it was each individual person kind of doing their thing. And so, so for, with this band, I waited my drummer, Mark Pontius, who was a friend of mine, he's okay. playing in another band. I had waited. I knew I was like, if I'm going to start another band, because I wasn't even sure I was doing solo stuff at the time. And I was like, I wasn't sure I wanted to, but I knew if I was going to do it again, that I wanted to start it with him. And he was like my favorite drummer in LA. Okay. And he was the guy. And kind of around the time when I was starting to get the confidence to build a band again because every time one of those other bands failed it's like the wind just goes out of your sails and you just it takes so much work to get people to like get people together to get the songs right to get the shows feeling good to get the word out to build your website to like build an audience all of those things and it takes money and it takes effort and it takes time and it takes perseverance and and it's like it's a grind it's a real grind and by that point for me, I was like, if I'm going to do this, I, I, I feel like I, at the time and who knows, I feel like I only had one more in me. Okay. Cause I was like, I had been trying, I'd been doing it, you know, trying for eight years already in LA grinding, working in restaurants, working in coffee shops, just scraping stuff together. I got so close to getting record deals, but it didn't happen. Right. And, and, you know, anyway, uh, the timing just worked out his band was breaking up at the same time we were talking about playing together more i was like let's try this let's try something and at the same time i always i always have my eyes open on musicians around town i'm always just like looking and you know hanging out and you know it's a, there's always a little catalog in the back of my head of like who <laughs> plays what and who i like hanging out with and you know if i oh if i need this guy this is the guy i would call whatever and at that time it just kind of it was, it was, it was around friendships and there was a new friend that I'd made and I liked his vibe on bass and I knew, and him and Mark were both surfers and I knew that they would love each other. They were like kind of cut from the same cloth. And I, and so I was like, all right, I'm going to introduce Cubby and Mark, the rhythm section. It's so important. The rhythm section gels and they're friends it's, and they're tight. It's half, like, it's tight half personally. It's half the battle. That's it right there. I built right the banner on the rhythm section. And then, um, you know, and then over time we started playing together and then everything, once that came, once the right people came together in the room, everything else was easy. Do you remember the moment? This is important. I do. Do you remember the moment when you all looked at each other? Yeah. And it went flash. Yeah. It was our first real show that we played together. I, I remember the moment because I was really nervous right because we weren't sounding good in rehearsal okay like we hadn't rehearsed enough yet 
And I was like, we're, we are so loose. Like we're not tight enough yet. We sound like shit. And I was like, and now we're going out there and we've got, you know, some industry there and our friends are coming out and like, and it's, I was like, oh man, what's going to happen? Like, this is bad. We're not ready. And then we stepped onto that stage and everybody, and, and it was just like, boom, like everybody played brilliantly. And I realized I'm like, oh, okay. Under pressure, all these guys play better. They play better when they're under pressure. They, they are, they're all stars. Like none of them are going to crack under pressure. They, for whatever reason, it just, it just, it, it activated them. And, and, and I, and that, that moment happened again and again and again throughout our career. You know, the first three years was such a tidal wave of never feeling ready. Like never, right when we would get used to playing in front of a hundred people, we were playing in front of 400 people, right? When we got used to playing in front of 400 people, we're playing in front of a thousand people. And, and it just kept going. We're just like, when are we ever going to feel confident? Like every time I stepped onto the stage, I'm like, oh, we are going to die. We are going to fail. Tonight is the night where it all falls apart. And the phones are going to, it's going to go on YouTube. Why, why do we all feel that TV. way? Why do we feel that way, right? <laughs> and we are going to be a laughing stock and everything is done. Like, that's what I was just like, tonight's the night. But every single time, I mean, not every time, sometimes we did bomb, but, you know, our gear didn't work or whatever. But most of the time in those high pressure situations, everybody would deliver, you know? That's great. Man. That's great. Man. Yeah. What's your, um, what's your favorite Foster the People song that you guys have, have done in your heart? I don't know. Your favorite one. You have a favorite? Or, they, or do they change from time to time? They change. They change. Yeah, I don't have I don't have a favorite. They're like they're kids. Like, they're, they're like kids. They're, 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 they really they are like kids. They are like kids. I don't have any kids, but I feel like they are my kids. I feel like I, I like I can't pick one. They're all different. Right. I love them for different reasons. Um, okay. You know, on the let's let's talk yeah. about, let's talk about each one from each album that you that you that you have out. What's your favorite one from your first album? Uh, Houdini, I think. Okay. Houdini. Second album. Um I'm going to do it fast. Uh, I'm not give you time. Yeah, so, second album, uh, Pseudologia Fantastica or Fire Escape. Fire Escape's an acoustic one that's really special. But Pseudologia is, uh, that's definitely one of our favorite ones to play live. Um, third album. Third album. Uh, um, Lotus Eater or... Static Space Lover. Those are right right now, right now. Those are my favorite. Yeah. And then and then on this latest EP uh that we just put out, and we put out a bunch of singles in between. I mean, Imagination is one of my favorite songs we've written. This latest EP right now, personally, Under the Moon. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they but but it does change. It changes. All right. And song and songs are like living, breathing things, you know. It's like I feel like a you know a good a good song, a timeless song, should should morph and shift in time as life goes on. And like you know, if the if the lyrics are written in a way, and and written in such a way that you can you can take different. If there's multiple meanings behind each phrasing, okay, you know you can dive into it as you get, as you change and as life changes and, and get something new out of it, you know? I mean, that's why I always go back to Dylan's music, you know? It's like the metaphors are so strong. So strong. And they're so open and like, you know that it's a feeling. It's not a literal, like there are literal storytelling things obviously, but there's a feeling that you're left with that you can dive into forever. And, you know, you can get, yeah, it's just, I don't know. That's, that's when you okay. do it well, I think. <laughs> So now I'm going to throw back to something that we've done together because I want to tie that in here. And yeah. when, when COVID struck, um, I came up with a song called One Day at a Time. And um, it got a lot of views on, uh, on Facebook. It was just a piano vocal. And um, it, it, uh, it morphed into let's go in the studio and you know, put out, put out this song because it, it was really important. One day at a time, we're all in this together, you know, it, and, and the camaraderie. 
So I called uh, some of the guys from my band, Route 66, and uh, and then I called you and I said, you know, I really could use your help on this. And we had, uh, you know, been been like chums, and I'd been over to your studio, and and we kind of started you know, jamming on on something called uh, something about a shadow. I lost my shadow, or my my shadow went out. Dancing, went out me dancing, dancing with, with my shadow. shadow. Or so. Dancing yeah. with my shadow. That was it. Yeah. So. Um, uh, you were you were so generous, and you came to the studio. And this is in the day where we're, we're wearing gloves, masks, you know, hoodies, everything. I got a test the you know the day before, you know, I came in. Here's my test. I'm negative, you know. And you came down, and we played, and um, and then yeah, um, you you took uh, took the files home and worked on it, orchestrated, throw some vocals on the top, made the bridge absolutely sail. I got to tell you. And uh, I want to thank you for that. And hopefully, we'll, you know, you guys that are going to edit this or whatever, throw that little video in there and throw that little song in there, that little piece that we did together. And, and that was great. Well, I got to tell you, that was so fun, uh, you know, and it was also, it was really inspiring for me because I hadn't recorded music like that with a lot, like musicians live at the same time right. in a very long time. And because, you know, my songwriting process has been so in the box and kind of electronic and overdubs or isolating instruments that playing like that with all of you guys who are incredible musicians, I felt like I was like, oh, shit, I got to practice. <laughs> like I was like, I was like, the pressure's on right now. I don't I, I, I am like, I am not confident in the chords I'm hitting right now. I was like wrapping my head around the changes. I was like. Oh man, I, I I was on I was on that piano with you guys. I was like, dude, I don't want to touch anything right now because I don't want to fuck anybody up. <laughs> um, but then when I got home with it and got to take my time with it, yeah, that's when that bridge stuff came out, you know. But uh, but but it, but it inspired me, you know, it inspired me. I was like, man, this is like this is how record. These are my all my favorite records were made like that, right? Because there's humanity in it. I like making but records like that. People just don't make records like that. I know, but my generation doesn't make records like that. Yeah, they, well, there's two ways of making records. There's, there's, you know, there's ones with imagination, like I'm, like you do, and and I've done with you, you know, trying to trying to come up with ideas and things like that. And the other one is, is you play the song, you find yourself a part, you fit in, you try not to step on anybody, and yeah. and and you try to get, try to make the magic happen. And sometimes it's really cool. It was really cool. Sometimes when magic happens and you guys. go in and listen to the playback, yeah. you go, yeah, that's funny. that's well, it inspired me because all the songs I've been writing, like pretty much after that time, kind of in quarantine, were have been really in, intended to be recorded like that live. Cool, you know, and I, and I want to make a record like that because I've never made. I mean, our first record. We, you know, we tracked drums and bass together and stuff, but it wasn't everybody doing full passes of the song. And uh, like, that was really cool. Oh, excellent, man. So I get a thank you yeah. on the next record or what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, get a, you, get a th you get a thank you on every record, T-Bear. <laughs> every so, record from here on out. Uh, I want to tell everybody, you just, you just celebrated your first anniversary. Yes, sir. You got married. Yeah. You're a married guy. Let's see your wedding ring. Ta-da! <laughs> Thank you. I love that you found love, and I love that you're happy, and you're in Atlanta supporting your uh, wife right now, right? Yeah. Doing the hang with her. Yeah. Hanging everybody, with everybody her. Everybody should know his wife is in most... Tell us about your wife a little bit from your perspective. I mean, I can I can really give her, you know, blow it up, but I want to I want to hear it from the husband. Oh, well, I mean, she is the sweetest woman ever. Uh, I've we've, you know, known each other for like 7 years and, you know, uh, got married I mean, it's kind of crazy because we got married right at in at the end of December, at the end of uh, 2019, and then boom, like this year happened. But she's an uh, and but it was actually a blessing in disguise because 
I was supposed to be on tour the entire time and she was working the entire time in a different city and we got to be together. So it was, it was awesome, but no, she's so special and she's, you know, she's an actress. She's incredible. Um, and what's, and what's and her so, name by the way? <laughs> Julia Garner. <laughs> she's an amazing actress. Go see Ozarks. Yeah. Yeah. Emmy, yeah. Emmys, Emmys, Emmys. I mean, yeah, she's she is where the air is rare, kids. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. She's a special artist. And, and, and it's, you want- know, and it's cool. It's cool, uh, you know, to be in a uh, to be able to have uh, creative depth, like with my like with my wife, like she yeah. understands my creativity. I, I love acting and film. And so I get to like dive into her world and uh, have that mutual a mutual respect, but also like just you know, she challenges my the way that I think, which is awesome. You know, I've never I've never been in a relationship like that before with an artist. It's just like pushed me. You I know, so it's of, really it's think, really I, nice. I think of four words right now uh, that kind of sum this up in in a way. Um, these are the days. Yeah. These are the days that you will never forget yeah that will remain with you forever and yeah and uh, you know there's nothing like love there's nothing like support and there's nothing like two people sharing such a mutual respect and 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 just pure adoration for one another in a way that's not that's not superficial in a way that's really spiritual. Mm. That's what I think. And yeah. th- these are the days. Okay, I got one last question for you. And then I know you got to go because you got lots of stuff. And we've just been doing the hang forever now. But tell me something that nobody knows about you, Mark Foster. Oh, well, I've worked every job under the sun um i've (laughs) let's see well i was one the week that i decided to do music and talked about that conversation with my dad earlier i was one signature away from joining the air force whoa and i had taken my ASVAP test. I had picked out a job. I was really, I was getting phone calls from the recruiter every day. When are you going to come in and sign? We're going to give you a big signing bonus because I, I, I did really well in the ASVAP test. Picked this killer job. I was so excited because the job came with level one security clearance and I had no clue what the job entailed. I had no clue, but I had no clue what I was going to do with my life. And I was like, this is, I think my only option because I barely graduated high school. So I was really close and, and then had that conversation. And that was kind of like, oh, I'm supposed to do music. I'm not supposed to join the military right now. And it's crazy because a month later, 9-11 happened. Wow. And all of my friends that signed up, doesn't matter what job they picked. They were all given a gun and some boots. And they're saying, hey, you know, it's time to go play in the sand. Yep. Um, so it's kind of, it's just, you know, I think back on that conversation and that moment. But yeah, man, I was real, I was really close, really close. That's interesting. That's a, that's a, that's a great way to leave this. Um, you know, and it, but it's funny too, T-Bear, because I've always tied music, music and war, like warfare. Music has something in it. Right. It's, it brings peace, but it can also cut through. It, it's also a sword, you know, and, and not, not in war, physical war, but it's like spiritual war, emotional war, mental war. You know, music is a weapon in that way, you know, yeah. using joy as a weapon. Yeah, it's, the, it's, it's, it's a language that everybody on earth understands, music. And it's really interesting, you know? Yeah, sometimes you step on stage or you write a song and you're like, this is gonna set people free. And there is something behind it that feels, there's an energy behind it. It's not like kumbaya, 
you know, it's like that doesn't always work. You know, sometimes sometimes you got to come with a sword to be able to to like let the truth ring, you know, loud and clear. Agreed. You know, agreed. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think uh, I think the, the the what I've gleaned from this conversation, this musical hang, you know, and and uh, and by the way, my new album comes out. On, I got to plug it. April April nineteenth. Uh, which was my late wife's birthday. We're putting my album. Oh, out. I love that. Yeah, yeah I love so that's, that. That's going to be, that's going to be, it's very exciting. It's coming up. Um, so what I gleaned from this conversation is, and I heard this told by uh, Yogi Berra, the, the, uh, the, the catcher of the Yankees, right? I have his baseball card. Okay. So you're going to love this. <laughs> I love Yogi Berra. What a character. When you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> that's great <laughs> all right brother thanks for pollinating good talking to you man today. <laughs> uh so good talking to you always it's good hanging great seeing you yeah i'll see yeah. you soon yeah all right see ya